Happy New Year! It's the Old Timers Comic Book Show where the hosts aren't old, although we are a year older, but the comics most certainly are. I'm your host, Johnny Machine Hughes, and surviving Christmas and New Year, we have the Professor. Hey, what's up, Johnny? I'm very well. How are you, sir? I'm very, very good. Very, very good. Excellent. And of course, no old time show would be the same without our youngest member of the crew. It is 13th Crusader. 13th. How's it going, my friend? Feliz Año Nuevo. Is that Happy New Year? Si, sí, senor. Ah. Mi buenos dias. Uh, buenos dias, senor. That's good. Excellent. 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 Do you all both have a good Christmas? It was very quiet, yeah, which is quiet. good for me. Yeah. I didn't get any geeky stuff this year at all. Not yeah. a single thing. Same as Bud, um, as I said off off camera. Yeah, I, I didn't get what I wanted. Yeah, <laughs> on that note, um, I I tell you what I did recently though. I've, I've uh, got rid of some some clutter in my uh, comic collection, and I managed to pile it for three books instead. And um, I've got a Batman three forty six. I got the final part of Batman Year One. Um, and I got this beauty. There you go. Mm -hmm. Look at that. that looks very familiar. <laughs> We've talked about that on the pod. Yes, we have, and that's why I bought it. Yeah. Um, it's not a great grade. It's a, probably a good. There's some some spine roll. I don't know if you can see that, and the staples are at the wrong side. It's well bit. read. Yeah. So now, I was quite well. So I was like, I know I wasn't overly loving the book when I when I looked at it on the show, but I was like, you know what, I do. Have a tendency to get the books that we talk about. So, yeah. That, that just, was uh, just to clarify for the audience, what I was really looking for was Amazing Fantasy 15, but I'm never nice enough. <laughs> a little too naughty. Yeah. Yeah, you get Amazing Fantasy 14 instead or something crazy like that, right? Yeah. But hey, Superpowers is a good call. Yeah, it's nice. It's, nice, it's, nice. it's going somewhere. It's fine. It'll Kirby go with my. Um, yeah, yeah. Kirby DC. It's going to go with my Cyberforce number one, which I picked up for a pound somewhere. Oh, that was a Jeopardy question. Yeah. With yes. velocity. Well, no, she was, yeah. Yes, she was. Yeah. yeah. Didn't get that right, is it? All right, fine. Enough about the Jeopardy. Thank you very much. <laughs> that, 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 my friend, is the ghost of Christmas forgotten. Never mind. Yeah. Ghost of Christmas past. Uh, Joe would like to come back and do again. So. Oh, good God. I don't know. <laughs> We save, can we save that for when I'm in July when I'm away and you guys could do that without me, yeah? Perhaps. <laughs> we'll wait. Uh, we'll wait for Johnny. Yeah, yeah. I will take my annual ass kicking. Thank you very much. All right. So 2024 has started, um, although not at the time of recording. Um, so that means another year has ticked on to the 25 year uh, clock we use here at all time. As we are now talking books from 1999 all right hey. so can anyone remember did anything major happen in 1999 comic book wise because i've done a little bit of research and everything seems to be quite flat at this time i don't know yeah uh, there's a couple of things yep. um one of the big things is um dc took over wildstorm comics oh cool excellent yeah so that's that was that would have been uh Mark Silvestri's arm of image, right? Is it not mm -hmm. Jim Lee's? No, Jim Lee. Oh, Jim Lee. Okay. Yeah. I think. But Sylvester Mark Silvestri came out. with it, right? Mark Silvestri was part of that as well, wasn't he? Was he? I don't think so. I think it was Jim Lee's Wildstorm and Silvestri's Top Cow. I'm sure it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're right. Top Cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but nope. you're right. So Wildstorm was Jim Lee's arm yep. of, of image. So he. Mm -hmm. Was he basically left image, right? And came cool. over to DC. Um, oh, that's big news. I looked on, I've got a site, uh, I don't know if anyone's used it. It's called Comic Cron. Um, it's dead easy to find, just hide it in your Google. And you can go back and you can look at all the different uh sales of of books. Um, apparently, the number one book of 20 of 1999, guess what it was? Uh, the, the the relaunch of Spider Man number one. Nope. Thirteen. Batman Harley Quinn. Nope. Give over. <laughs> Give over. 
According to the website, the number one selling book of that year was Tomb Raider number one from Image. Mm. Number two was X-Men number 86. Uh, Uncanny X-Men was 367. Batman doesn't feature in the top 100. Oh, I wonder I why. Some, I don't know why. There's some JLA in there as well. Um, JLA is probably the only, I'm having a look down the list, is the only DC book that's in there. Um, Batman War on Crime was the f- number one selling graphic novel. So there you go. Well, on the uh, on the Marvel side, um, the couple of the couple of things I just mentioned was the reboot of Spider Man. All yep. of the books started with new issue ones. Yep. Um, same thing a couple of months later with the Incredible Hulk. Mm-hmm. And um, that devil the, maybe. Yeah. Well, it was the relaunch or the re uh, the the launch of the Marvel Knights Marvel trade Knight. dress yes. with um, with Daredevil. Uh, Black Widow, Punisher, uh, Punisher yes. Black Panther, um, a lot of those books. Uh, Chris Priest's Black Panther, by the way, um, mm-hmm. all all launched with uh, the Marvel Knights trade, which was more uh, more stories geared towards mature readers um, and more uh, more focused with Marvel. Uh, they were kind of getting away from the art first and kind of yeah. refocusing on telling great stories. And some of the greatest writers of what we now know, the 2000s, right, uh, mm-hmm. were, were really coming up in here. Bert, Kurt Busiek, mm-hmm. um, Mark Wade, mm-hmm. uh, some really good artists and writers still. So Chuck Dixon over at DC? Yep. Who so, would eventually thirteen become Bat God, right? Mm-hmm. He yeah. was literally the real life mayor of Gotham City. <laughs> True <laughs> that. True that. All right, so we've got three books for you to have a look at. Three books. Um, first one. Um, it started in nineteen ninety eight, but concluded in ninety nine. But we can forgive this because you know what? We all get our days mixed up over Christmas and New Year, don't we? Yeah. Well, in my defense, the first issue was is a december date. that's fine I'm, that's fine that's and then the fine. rest of it came out yeah i suppose yeah. Yeah, it's like, that's the tip of the iceberg and then whoa look out no, the vast right. majority. <laughs> yes so we're talking about avengers forever um this is we're looking at specifically issue number 12 to 12 of 12 uh mini series or maxi series uh could not find a price on this on go collect for some reason um <laughs> Uh, I found an eBay price, uh, eight pounds ninety five, and as we've already alluded to, it came out in nine, this issue came out in nineteen ninety nine. Written by Coop Buziak, Roger Stern is also listed as the credit somewhere. Carlos Pacheco is artist. Jesus Marino is inks. Allioptics dot com are colours, uh, and the letters are Richard Starkins and Albert Deshensny. I've probably said that wrong, but. I'm going with that. Um, Professor, this was your call. This was your call, my friend. This was by far the biggest event for me in 1999 was the Avengers Forever miniseries. And um, I'm glad we get to finally talk about it (laughs) because... You've been waiting. How many shows have we done? (laughs) I've been waiting for three years. This is why I joined (laughs) Ultim. We can eventually talk about it. I'm going to join this show because in three years' time, we're able to talk about this book. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this uh this really was a, kind of like a spin-off of because because kurt, kurt busiek along with george Brez relaunched the avengers book after the book came back over from uh from the image stable right mm-hmm. um and this really is i think the story busiek wanted to tell when he took over avengers mm-hmm. um we all know busiek is um a huge fan of continuity. I think I put Busiek up there right with um, with Mark Runewald when it comes to um, his knowledge of everything mm-hmm. Marvel um, that has come in the past. And he loves that wheelhouse of just kind of going back and playing with all the toys in the sandbox from, you know, 1940s and 50s onwards. Um, and this story was basically uh, an Avengers love letter um, to the different eras of the uh, of the Avengers, um, he takes 
deep cuts into um, what has come before, gets jumped in, jumps into the storyline. The the of course the major protagonist of Avengers Forever is Immortus and Kang, um, and their relationship. Um, it's basically uh, it's it's what's called uh, the Destiny War, and um, of and Mortis is trying to um, destroy all other timelines and have this one uh, perfect timeline. And the he has this uh, uh, you'd call it a MacGuffin, um, Johnny, with uh, what's called the Forever Crystal, where oh, he no. uses. This, what's called the forever crystal <laughs> to destroy the branches of the timeline that he doesn't like. And so he wants to have this one tri timeline that he is the overall ruler of. And um, it's up to Kang who basically runs all the other timelines who doesn't want to be destroyed. He wants to be able to continue to conquer all the other storylines. So he recruits um, these uh, the seven Avengers from different timelines, uh, along with uh, with Rick Jones, who oh, um, he reawakens the power that Rick Jones had in the Kree Scroll War, where he was able to pull um, characters from different times, mm -hmm. puts them all together on one team, and that's actually the selling point on this book, to tell you the truth, because each Avenger is from a different time in a different space in their um in their timeline the captain america is the uh the pre-nomad captain america like right okay. right uh, right after uh nixon kills himself in the white house mm -hmm. so he's very disillusioned very um kind of uh has kind of lost his way a little bit so that's a kind of a really interesting captain america to have is mm -hmm. your captain america in this book the hawkeye is from uh right after the kree scroll war um so he he is no longer goliath but he's hawkeye and he was in the traveling circus he has no trick arrows which i thought was super interesting um two different hank pims in this book which i loved it was the yellow jacket um the but but the yellow jacket that was uh that believed that he killed hank pym didn't know he was hank pym um, and then, of course, the current Goliath, current Janet, um, and uh, then two future Avengers, Songbird uh, from the Thunderbolts, who at, at this point, at this point in current continuity, she's in the Thunderbolts as a villain. Um, and uh, the debut of a new Captain Marvel um, in this series with uh, the Genis, Genis Vell character becoming Captain Marvel. And you find out throughout this series um, that Captain Marvel is actually bonded to a future Rick Jones, um, which in this issue actually resolves itself to where Captain Marvel or the Genesis becomes bonded to the current Rick Jones, which leads to the, the launch of a new Captain Marvel book, which was uh, fantastic can't wait to talk about that one either by the way <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is our wish list coming forward now <laughs> yeah so so this issue in particular is um really a big fight issue where it's just like avengers for days fighting each other um and it's basically what it is like now where every single character in the Marvel universe at some point has been an Avenger. Mm -hmm. When you see that like page two and three spread of just like uh, millions of characters just fighting each other. And, and you're like, Oh, that guy's never been an Avenger, but he's going to be an Avenger at some point. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was just interesting just to see who Carlos Pochigo could kind of squeeze in there somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. that's look at that. <laughs> that's a great splash page yeah bonkers, um like. yeah so you and, and you see some you know some characters that you've never seen before some characters that turn up later some characters that you just don't know they are mm -hmm. um just it's just interesting look look characters that have like a like a little bit of a difference like you see tigra in the corner there which she's got like the hairy arms like oh, yeah. okay i don't think we've ever seen a tigra like that is that um, crystal there with the funny hair uh, yep crystal hair. uh you get a one-eyed hercules you get you know some 
characters are super interesting. Um, and then it just comes down to like, so in this, by this time, Immortus has been killed by mm. Kang. Um, and then, oh no, by the Time Lords, or the, mm -hmm. the Time Keepers. And, uh, and everything gets resolved in this issue by the end mm. with a rebirth of Immortus who ends up, um, you know, basically uh, going back to uh, where he came from. This, and then, of course, you have the, the Supreme Intelligence. Excuse me. It's super yeah. confusing to just talk about the last issue. <laughs> Sorry. That, uh, that's a short there. Uh, maybe we should do a whole show on the whole 12 issues. I don't know. Maybe. It's, but, you know, I love the, uh, the, the, the way that it comes together at the end mm -hmm. with where you realize Captain Marvel is, you know, going to be a force in this new going forward. Um, Songbird returns to the future with some future Avengers like Jack of Hearts, who does actually yep. become an Avenger of, uh, in the future. Um, dying and then dying again and then coming back and dying again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, interesting things. I, I loved this book um, just because I think Busiek had such a great time writing it. Mm -hmm. And some of the characters that appeared previously, they don't appear here, but um, like they brought back Kill Raven. Like one of the futures that they went to was the, the, Mar the you know, the, uh, the uh, War of the Worlds future from Kill Raven. Mm -hmm. they, they went back in time to the 1950s uh, Avengers, which is actually the Agents of Atlas. Um, they renamed, but. Busiek renames them the Avengers. Um, I'll that shield. Look at that shield on that panel. <laughs> it's a pretty big shield. Yeah, um, that's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> they go back in time to the uh, the Wild West where we they run into the Two Gun Kid and Kid Colt. That's the episode. I've, that's the issue I've got. I've got yes. one of these issues, and we're talking uh, off screen. And that's the issue I've got. And I was like, "What's going on in this book? I have no idea." It's uh, it, they jump around a lot in the time, uh, in time, and it's just it's it's so much fun, and it's it's back when the time travel, even though they um they allude to the fact that whatever they do creates a branching timeline, uh -huh. they never really go investigate these other timelines. You know, uh -huh. not like it is a multiverse today where you yeah. never know which Captain America you're going to get. You always get the 616 Captain America. And, you know, they for some reason, they're in this different timeline. And if this, they run into the different timeline, they're generally bad guys. <laughs> so this, this, them. this kind of throws up a question for me then, because I know this is your book and 13th. Um, I'm not sure if you've been re reading recent Marvel, but... It wasn't that long ago Jason Aaron was, was throwing all loads of Avengers through, together through different timelines. And we hate that book. Yeah. So what's the difference? How does this book work so well and the Jason Aaron book doesn't? Um, because I don't think they lose sight of who that, the actual heroes are in the book. Oh, okay, cool. Right? I think you have your team that, that they introduce in issue one. Mm -hmm. And anything that happens to them throughout this book, it's happening to them. Okay. And if they're running into other versions of themselves, it's not like they're being introduced um, to have like a future appearance. Do you know what I mean about that? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. Uh, it's not like they're being uh, debuted for a future limited series. It's kind of like yeah. a hey, it's, it's, all, it's organic. It's not gonna. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. hey. Here's this random ass character from Earth six four six. Yeah. Um, and. You know they're gonna be here for five minutes and then you're never gonna see them again which i mean that is actually what was happening in jason aaron's run mm -hmm. but the the way they introduce these characters is that like like they're like pivotal to the storyline yeah. here they're not they're just window yeah. dressing cool excellent so. cool uh 13th Are you were a fan of the avengers of this time no okay <laughs> <laughs> all right okay so my thought no go on then what? yeah yeah, I, I this is uh, I, I have no issue with uh, Buziak's writing or anything like that. I think my my qualms with this book, kind of to counter what what was said earlier. Okay. Um, I agree. I agree what you said at the beginning of the show, where I, I feel like maybe the late '90s fell flat, because as we all know, the the beginning of the '90s started with an art explosion, 
Yep. And that kind of dictated how stories went. Yep. As we get towards the latter half of the decade, people were starting to realize like you kind of need a story with the art. So that yeah. realization came came forward again. I think Avengers Forever kind of fit that bill in that regard. Because as Bud said, Buziak is, you know, he's an Avengers scholar, if you want to call him that. Mm. Um, however, with this particular 12 issue run, I, to me, it's an, a crisis of infinite Avengers where you have all of these multiple timelines where remember in the nineties, it, it was, you had a lot of collectors either leaving collecting or uh -huh. just people jumping in. So not everybody may have been, uh, as, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, into okay. Avengers like yeah, that yeah. Or, yeah. or involved or even know what's going on. You have relaunches happening. And a lot of that, I think, was driven by sales. You know, you have image in the market. Mm -hmm. So that kind of dictates like, well, we got to do something quick. Mm -hmm. So why not come up with a 12-issue series that literally has every Avenger, including ones in case we're going to use them in the future or not, mm -hmm. or debut them here or, or give a preview of the future. So it's, it's a long, convoluted way just to get to uh, a genus Marvel, as I call them. Okay, but um, the art here, I, I wasn't sold on it too much, although some of the character designs I like. Um, and it's in some panels, I found it to be very confusing. Okay, so where it kind of drowns out the, the text, and then in other panels, I think it was just way too much, much text. But mm -hmm. anytime when you're dealing with Kang or Immortus, and you know, obviously, time is always going to be the, the focus of it. Uh -huh. And the Avengers got dragged along for it. So I, I don't have an issue with Kang. I don't have an issue with Immortus. Um, I just think that this is just a, it's a lot of noise to, to arrive uh, to a certain point to, uh, for the Avengers continuity to, to keep going on. Okay. I mean, that, you know, you, he's not wrong. In the 13th, you're absolutely right. It, there is a lot of, it is a fight issue primarily. And to Bud's point, um, we are looking at issue 12. If we'd had time to look through all the other issues preceding this, then we would have enjoyed the setup as much as the punchline. And I totally get that. Um, so we are, we might be doing the, the whole series a bit of a disservice, and I, and I apologize for that. Um, for me, um, I'm glad Bud recapped it because I read this book, um, even though I've got a couple of issues, and I was like, what's going on? And I totally get. <laughs> I totally get 13th point. It is Crisis of the Infinite Avengers. And I kind of think that it needed to be because we've had uh, Heroes Reborn and then that's when the Image Guys took over and went in a totally different direction. This is this is Marvel kind of getting their characters back and stamping their feel back on them to say, right, this is where we're at. In fact, if you look at some of the continuity towards the end of the book, um, we see the, the, the cap of... Captain America. Captain America. Captain yeah. America, you know, we see his all the negative things that are going to happen to him uh, in this, which re, sort of reintegrates this book into the Marvel Universe as we know it, by therefore, therefore bypassing the image um, elements. Um, I will say, um, some of the art looks very much like Alan Davis, um, especially this panel, and how on earth Miss Marvel's boob, side boob, got through the editors, I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like I'm glad it did. But that's just me being a perv. There you go. Um, so yeah, it's loud. It's noisy. If you're an Avengers fan, like like the professor is, you know what this is. A, this is back back to the greatness, isn't it? Kurt, Kurt Busiek, you can it talk is. about you can talk about being like a, a major writer. But in fairness, he probably wasn't. He's not like like the superstar writer, is he? I mean, he wrote Marvels, and that was great, but then it's kind of like, that was on the down low. You know, getting people like Kurt Busiak, Roger Stern, Mark yeah. Wade later on, this was an effort to consolidate and create that Marvel feel again, away from that pizzazz the image brought to the fore. Well, and Busiak, I believe, at this time, was also doing um, Astro City, right? So he was doing his own thing, but then he was also writing Avengers for Marvel, which I, I mean, I don't know if you, if you guys remember Astro city, but no. I thought Astro city was, uh, was fantastic kind of out of the box superhero writing. 
Well, I think that's what I well, that's what I think about Bruce Jack. When I hear his name, I don't think straight up superhero stuff. I, I I'm always expecting something that's a little bit different. Yeah. Marvels is a prime example of that. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah, but he was also writing the Core Avengers book at this time too, which was fantastic with Perez. Cool. Oh, you love your Perez, bless you, Cotton. Uh, I, I do. Yeah, the late great George Perez on Avengers, definitely. It was this was, and, and you're right. This was definitely an Avengers Renaissance yeah. going on in 1999, 1998. To bring back the the fans, you're not yep. the speculators, the 100%. people who the, bring back the fans who knew their Avengers history, the people who cared which Hawkeye it was versus which Cap it was versus. Uh, whatever, so that's cool. No, yep. excellent, good shout, good call for our first uh, first book. Time for one of our ads before we get to the thirteenth book, and a brewing argument is is awaiting. <laughs> Can't wait. Oh, don't be like that. Just wait thirteen seconds, and you might get it. Uh, let's see. Let's have an advert for this show. There you have it, the No Prize Podcast for all your MCU, Disney Plus, comic book from Marvel that drops the day before us featuring this guy over there. That's in there. Okay. And that guy over there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Features. It's a, it's a Spider-Man meme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Next up is, um, <laughs> I love that meme, um, is uh, the 13th choice. Um, and 1999 was a bit of a breakout for this particular character. No, not the Joker. This is uh, Batman, Harley Quinn, uh, Go Collect have this as a 9.6 at $230. Wow. Um, eBay has it anywhere between 49 to 170 pounds, depending on grade. The reason why it's so expensive is this is the first in continuity and let's make sure we get this right it's the first in continuity appearance of harley quinn in comic books of course we all know that batman adventures number 12 is the first comic book appearance of harley quinn and if you're interested a 9.6 will cost you 900 dollars on ebay you can get this in the uk for 990 pounds amazing so they so when people say, oh, the first appearance of Harley Quinn, you've got to be right, right, 13th? It's the yep. first in continuity. So there's that argument sorted. Written by Paul Dini, um, art by, I'm going to say, Yavel Goucher. Aaron Saud is on inks. Colors and Separates are done by Richard and Tanya Horry, and Willie Schubert is on letters. Uh, 13th, as mentioned, this is your call. Take it away, sir. Yeah, so another uh, way to kind of say in continuity, in continuity is canonical. Oh, yeah, you could say that, but I, I can't say canonical. Neither can I. Yeah, I got lucky. Yeah, yeah. So I won't say it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I also yeah. can't, what's the other word I can't say? Can't say innovative. I have to think about it. Is it Michelini. innovative or innovative? I can't say Michaelini either. So it's fine. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll start off with the cover. Obviously, I, 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 you guys know that I like Alex Ross art. So this is uh, a classic, a, classic a, cover. Exactly. And um, through the years, we've learned that Alex Ross did this based off a photo reference of himself uh, as the Joker. I was going to say, he didn't hold himself like that, did he? That, that's no, a crazy he Saturday night if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was a photo reference uh, to display joker and harley so at this point as we all know that harley debuted in the batman the animated series and her popularity was increasing so here we are as johnny said yes yeah, she appeared in batman adventures which was a comic that followed the comic the uh the animated series but mm -hmm. we all know that in the in bat world there's there is canon at least at this point um and harley was uh gonna be a part of it so 
some of the elements of Harley Quinn remain the same where she used to be an employee of uh, Arkham Asylum as a psychiatrist who fell in love with the Joker. Everybody knows all of that. Um, in to get her into canon, um, she's found by uh, Poison Ivy and Poison Ivy finds her story to be interesting. So this story takes place in between the No Man's Land event that mm -hmm. went through all the uh, bat books at, during this time. And if that No Man's Land, as good as it is, it's an investment and a half. True There's a, a lot of books to go after. Some of them have increased in value. Um, now you have this thrown in the middle of it. it and so, you know, you're, you're living the day in the life of what's happening in Gotham City after this mm -hmm. event. So in comes Harley Quinn. And essentially she's, you're, you're getting a sort of an origin story mm -hmm. told through the, told through the character of Harley Quinn to Poison Ivy mm -hmm. and how she was infatuated with the Joker or, and or obsessed. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the, the foundation of Harley Quinn during this era of time. And they carry that over into canon. And the canon Joker, as we all know, is supposed to be not just a homicidal maniac, but also very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So how, how would he receive a character like Harley? someone who is you know devoted to him loyal to the joker you got to be out of your mind to be loyal to the joker so you get that dynamic mixed in here right away you you see that when she starts interacting with the joker mm -hmm. and then we all know if joker's involved batman's not far behind so it almost seems like the relationship is is uh all over the place and yep. it, it pretty much, uh, Batman's caught in the middle of that. So Batman is still Batman. He's still after the Joker. And Joker's pretty much, his attention is all focused on Batman. And he doesn't like Harley Quinn because of that. It's a, it's a distraction. And that's basically how, how it was with these two characters for a bit. Mm. Now, it, it is a long read, um, I would think. Okay. But um, the art, if I'm going to comment on it, it, it's tough when you see such a beautiful cover and then you open the pages, and that's a shout. It's it's something like completely different, and I get like all of these variant covers of today, so I'll bring that in there where you get like this beautiful art or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you open the pages and you're like, oh, what's going on? It's a dramatic departure from what you're seeing on the cover. But either way, the story here was still. Uh, serviceable to introduce Harley into uh, the bat world, if you mm -hmm. will. And um, yeah, I mean, as, as Johnny said, you know, when it comes to first appearances, you want to be careful because it is true. This is a first appearance of Harley, but you want to be careful and just be aware that uh, the real first appearance in a comic book is the, the Batman Adventures 12. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have any problems with this book. I'm curious to see what you're going to say to to counter me or argue with me on this. <laughs> um, My argument was the first appearance with stuff, so that's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, Harley, when the animated series came out and Harley debuted, I was like, what's going on? Kind of like the Joker in his book. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, you know what? This, I think this can work. Mm -hmm. And the popularity with Batman the animated series in general was just, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later was going to come into a comic book and here we are and harley made her debut here this was a prestige issue mm -hmm. uh dedicated to her which was good and it's a, it's in a way kind of bringing a new bat villain into ca canon mm -hmm. and batman in a way kind of reacts differently to certain characters so in this mm -hmm. case he's like okay i knew you worked at arkham so maybe he's looking at it from that angle but he's his level of trust is still low mm -hmm. And then he sees for himself that she's just as crazy as the Joker. So yeah. it, it has a little mix of everything here. Harley, in a way, was already building a name for herself based on the cartoon. And now she's mm -hmm. in canon for comics for people to enjoy her there. Um, she's gone through a lot of changes um, to today's era, but that's for the new timers. Mm -hmm. But this is pretty much a, an original version of Harley. Yeah. The, the things, a couple of things that strikes me from this first book... One, the Harley and Ivy thing, 
to start off early doors and two just how toxic and vicious her relationship with the joker actually is because the joker doesn't care one jot about her there's a scene where i don't know if i've passed it where um the, the running away and she shows up at the car and he's like oh i was just looking for you which was a complete not lie so here's my question but do you think harley's origin as it currently stands being stuck in the middle of a toxic relationship for practically 20 years because it's only been recently she's kind of fallen out of the fold of that do you think this type of storytelling would work in today's uh societal society aware audience uh no because they wouldn't have her remain in that relationship as long as she did they would have mm. her empowered and out of it which she is now right i mean mm -hmm. she she's and, and even even in this issue you uh -huh. see that she feels kind of empowered to get out of it but then you know she turns on a dime when she's when he says um would it help if I apologized? Yeah, <laughs> and she said yeah. yes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay. But that's um, when you when you when you read that, that comes off as uh, wow, she's nuts, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, when you, but I mean, there were a lot of people 25 years ago that stayed in relationships like this because mm. someone someone toxic said they were sorry, yeah. you know. So I think I think you also got to look at it from this angle too that she was a psychiatrist in Arkham yeah. who was a very brilliant and intelligent with a uh, mind mm -hmm. who this this was her life 24/7 and then she sees the patient that she can't crack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that caused her to crack instead. So yeah, she's intelligent. It's just oh. that this one part of her uh psyche is it's 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 re damaged beyond repair because of the Joker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of impacts how everything uh, goes from uh, moving forward. So the Joker is going to do this, not just to Harley Quinn. He's going to do this to anybody because yeah. it, it's all about him. Harley Quinn, it, you know, comes to the spotlight because this was something new back then. Uh, who, who treats the Joker at Arkham? Arkham is a psychiatric facility. Now mm -hmm. we got in, the, get the inside scoop of, okay, who is that unfortunate person? And here you are. This is the answer. Mm -hmm. Harley Quinn. But what do you think of the book? Take away the societal element. I've just dropped you on a big bomb there. What do you think of the, the book, the writing and so on? What, did you enjoy so, the book? Well, it was, it was interesting because, I mean, I knew Harley's origin and, you know, I, I liked her in the cartoon. Um, this was at a point in time where I wasn't really kind of, Batman wasn't really on the radar for me. I didn't really have. <laughs> That's um, so nah, just so you know. Yeah, okay. Batman, well, it was on the sonar. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But I mean, this was this and this Batman's really kind of a supporting character in this. This is really isn't his book. Yeah. This is Harley's book. Um, it, it was interesting. Um, I like the relationship because, uh, you know, Joker's just the Joker. And they, they do go out of the way to just show how um, sadistic and psychopathic that he really is. Um, mm -hmm. Which you don't really need to see that because you kind of know how Joker is. Mm -hmm. But. Um, there were a couple of pages. I'm just like, literally, is he going to try to kill her here? <laughs> is he going to try to kill her in this page? Yeah. Um, it's just kind of, uh, you never feel safe with Joker around. And and it really kind of uh, just shines a light on Harley herself mm -hmm. on, wow, how messed up do you have to be to care about him? So mm -hmm. it's it's interesting. And, and um, uh, just like you said before, uh, that Poison Ivy Harley relationship really starts on page one here, huh? I didn't yep. really expect that um, to kind of be such a focus, mm. and maybe, maybe, it, maybe it was a throwaway here, you know, that Poison Ivy comes with uh, with Harley. I didn't expect that relationship to continue twenty five years later. So this this book comes out, out well after the animated show, yep. um, and I think the animated show um alludes to a relationship between the two they're not just gal pals um but um obviously be, being a kid show they can't be as as i suppose obvious about it as you'd expect so i think this is a great way of kind of trying to move that along um from a relationship point of view um 
I think um, I'm kind of with with thirteenth on this. You look at the great cover and then you open it up, and I was so disappointed with the art inside. Um, this kind of over the top expressionist cartoon stuff doesn't always work for me, um, and I, I, I certainly don't like it on on something that's supposed to be like dark and serious. I suppose it's supposed you can use it as a juxtaposition between the light and the dark of the characters and how they're supposed to be fun and all that. But still, um, I would also say that for a large part, as good as Paul Dini is on Batman the Animated Series. I'm not necessarily a massive fan of his comic book work. I find I find some of his I find some of the the humor of the situation just a little bit too much. Um I found that on Zatanna, I find it here. Um it's as if the collaborative element of of animation works best when cuz it kind of like works with other people, maybe that tones him down or focuses the, the humor points that he wants to make rather than being all slapdash all the time um it looks like the joker's got two two eyes on that side there maybe that's crazy um i'm not a huge harley fan um i've grown to appreciate her um a lot um and that's kind of kind of where i am yeah um this is kind of one of those books that if you're a bat fan you should have or you should have read because it is as important to the joke character and to to harley especially for the tw next 20 years at least um but you know i just felt i came away like I, i'd seen it before you know it's been done it had been portrayed brilliantly in batman the animated series where the joker has the bomb in the in the gotham and Batman's using Harley to find out where the bomb is and then Harley realises that the Joker doesn't care and if the bomb goes off, she's going to blow up with it and all that sort of stuff. So, I get it. I've seen it. And I'm kind of like, mm, no. I'm a little bit nonplussed by it, to be honest. Yeah, that's I like, think that, that's what the challenge was. To, how yeah. do you carry her from a cartoon to a book? Yeah. And I think the last few pages of this, of this book answers that it's yeah. going to be a new foil for Batman not only does he have to worry about Joker and everyone else, now yeah. he's got another character that's probably on level with Joker, if not worse, yeah. because she's in within her right mind, except when it comes to the Joker. And yeah. again, she's not dumb. And that that's something new for, for Batman. It's like, oh, man, the, you know, what am I going to do now? It's like, mm. I, I think that's what this book served as an introduction into canon. Yeah, definitely. Because you have to answer the success of the, the cartoon. It was so successful. They knew this, so they had to do something about it, and here we are. No, it's good. No, I, no, it's an interesting read. I think from a, you, you, I think as a bat fan, as I said, you need to read it to, to get it. To, but for me, the, from looking backwards, you got to remember, nineteen ninety nine, I dropped out of comic books at this point. I wasn't collecting, I wasn't reading, so a lot of this year's stuff for me is going to be like brand new, unless I, it's in my collection now. Um, so. No, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of on, okay. With that. I think Carlo Pacheco was he not on the Flash book for a while? Did he not do like Impulse after it? Because he has that same. I'm sure I've had a car, the cartoon he started in that it worked so much better in that than he did there for me personally. But you know, hey ho. All right, last book, and this one kind of is my choice, and it kind of builds on what we were saying at the start of the show that 1999 and the years preceding and following. We're a way to get back to writing, not just about art. And that's this corker, in my opinion, of a book. It's Birds of Prey number eight. Um, now, there's an interesting fact about Birds of Prey number eight. The number eight uh, on Go Collect at 9.6, it'll cost you $75. Why? I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, on eBay, it'll cost you the princely sum of £40. Birds of Prey number one. Is worth of Go Collect fifty five dollars and ten pound on eBay. So this book is more expensive than its number one. Um, written by Chuck Dixon, art by Greg Land, uh, ink by uh, Drew Griasi, Gloria Vasquez is on colours, and Albert T. D. Guzman is on letters. To answer your question, Professor. So this is your parents. Hey, well, no, not just that. It's a supply and demand issue. Mm -hmm. This print, is a, print, low print run, low print run. 
low printing. Um, that's what drives this book. That and the fact that it's an absolutely well written comic book about two characters who have got such a long history. Um, as the cover alludes to it, it's date night for Nightwing and for Barbara Gordon. Uh, he's noticed the straps on her legs. No, he's not taking her to a bondage park. This is Bab Bab's when she was in Oracle mode. Uh, so she has lost the use of her legs. Um, Nightwing takes her out on a date, takes her to the circus, Haley's Circus, no less. There's some bad history for you. Um, in between that, you get a couple of jokes with killer clowns and bombs and so on and so forth. People just having a good time. The crux of the issue is when uh, Dick takes Barbara up on the trapeze to prove that she hasn't lost who she is when she lost the use of her legs. And this is kind of, I know John Astrander from um, Suicide Squad was instrumental in making Oracle a player in the DC universe, but this book goes somewhere to prove that to Barbara that she's still a player in the DC universe. The gay are all ready to tra trapeze up, have a nice moment on the, on the trapeze, catch fall, I'll always be here for you sort of stuff, have a nice romantic moment and then leave as friends. And this is, you've had the Joker and Harley have their 20 year romance go on through the comic books. Same with these two, you had the 20 years or 22 years of will they, won't they. And that's just from this book. Bear in mind they had a will they, won't they way before that anyway. So from 1990, 20 years of will they, will they not, will they, what will they. <coughs> For those people reading it, current DC continues, yes, they are a couple at the moment. Um, but this just shows how well written a comic book could be featuring two back characters and not a single solitary supervillain at all. So, yes, low print run makes it hard to find. What makes it popular? It's just a well-written piece of piece of piece of work, definitely. Greg Land does what Greg Land does best, um, and I think it's an absolute peach, an absolute peach of a book, from my personal point of view. Um, Professor. We'll go with you, and then we'll finish off with 13th as our DC expert. Um, I always uh, am very partial to these character books where mm -hmm. there's not a lot of a uh, lot going on other than uh -huh. how do these characters relate to each other, and does this does this issue move their relationship on along, which it does. Mm -hmm. um, I was I, now I hadn't ever really read Birds of Prey before. Um, but I thought there was a lot more characters in this book than Barbara Gordon and Black Canary. Where's Huntress? That she comes way down the line. Way so down, had, down was it, when this book started, was it just Barbara Gordon and Black Canary? That was yep. it? The team yeah, up and book? Then, okay. Yeah, and then they had like guest stars every now and again. So in like the kind of run-up, uh, Catwoman's in it for a little bit. Power Girl turns up. Um, it's kind of you, those two and they use operatives for certain missions. Okay. And then, then Huntress joins as a as a regular member. So uh, the other thing that struck me is just my love for um, this era of the DC universe versus the New Fifty Two mm -hmm. and Rebirth. This is my DC universe from post Crisis to Flashpoint. Yeah, you know, it's this cool. is my wheelhouse. I I love the DC characters, how they acted, the storylines, everything about it. Uh, it's just not the same anymore to me. If I was mm -hmm. to pick up a, uh, you know, a Batgirl book or a Nightwing book, it's just they're not the same characters anymore to me. Mm -hmm. So cool. Uh, this is this is great. Well, great pick because it, I loved I loved reading the book. Cool, excellent, high praise indeed. Thirteenth. Yeah, I'll throw some things in here, kind of piggybacking off, off of both of you. So, cool. yeah, it was it started off with Oracle and Black Canary, and then it eventually, you know, Huntress joins in. I call this DC's Charlie's Angels for the, the real old-timers. I remember yeah. that show. Um, My name's Charlie. These three met. All characters that have a good uh, history. Uh, once upon a time in the 70s, if you remember, Mm -hmm. These characters uh, were tasked to try to help Bat book sales. 
that was also mm -hmm. an old Jeopardy question. So here we are now uh, at this point in time with Chuck Dixon, who, as we said earlier in the show, mm -hmm. was literally the mayor of Gotham City and Bloodhaven. Mm -hmm. So that... how can these characters stand on their own? Well, why not? They have a rich history. It's on full display here uh, for Barbara Gordon, for Dick Grayson. It's on full display. And they basically grew up together in the Bat world. Mm -hmm. Batman uh, trained Robin. Batgirl pretty much just joined the fun. Mm -hmm. She trained herself. She had a, a very strong uh, mind to do detective work. She is the daughter of a police commissioner after all. Mm -hmm. So it all fits in. But how? How does that all fit in? And I think this issue answers that emphatically. And one thing I know about Chuck Dixon writing, he's going to tell you that there's a relationship, but he doesn't have to show you that uh, so much as to uh, like super details. Like, hey, we're going out on a date. It doesn't have to get to mm -hmm. this point and everything like that. It's all about how do you arrive to that point. The readers can come to their own conclusion that there is no doubt that there are feelings there uh, between them both. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of history, uh, trauma that they both experienced, trauma that they're still dealing with. And I think the biggest answer of all that you get with this issue is how do they overcome that? Mm -hmm. And do you do that alone or together? And I think it, I think the answer is all of the above. Uh, mm -hmm. With what they do uh, on the side or what they've done with, with Batman in the past mm -hmm. definitely impacts them. And I think this is why... DC, this was a turning point for DC, in my opinion, because the the sidekicks, if you will, or the B-list B characters, I'm not talking about Nightwing and, mm -hmm. and Oracle, but I think they started to come to the forefront with actual solid stories and a foundation. Mm -hmm. And this is just another example here where Nightwing is an established character, leader of the Titans. Oracle is a huge driving force um, at this point already. Mm -hmm. So now um, that's on display for the for the readers to enjoy. You get a, a very solid story here with Chuck Dixon, mm -hmm. and and this run would go on to be uh, a very solid run. And, and the scarcity of this issue attracts people to it, but it's also the cover tells you everything. This is everybody refers to this as the Nightwing and Batgirl dating uh, book. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's okay. definitely a, a worthwhile uh, pickup for sure. Uh, what I'll say, but I suppose my final point on this is when we people talk about Birds of Prey, we automatically think of Gail Simone. And so they should. Gail Simone had, in the first volume especially, had a great run on this book. It was where they introduced Huntress into the book, Professor <coughs> and Zinda and all those sort of things. Um, people forget that Chuck Dixon started this book. It's the same way people forget that Joe Duffy was the writer on the Catwoman book before Chuck Dixon took that over. Right? These are people who are who are going out on a limb with these these additional books that fill out the bat universe um to to make something and then go from that point on um chuck dixon ends up on batman he ends up detective you know he he, he is the mayor of gotham and we've interviewed him a couple of times and he's such a such a uh, gracious uh, guest it's really good i'm so glad that everyone loves this book because i think to me it's this is could be this, this is one of the best books I think that I've read because it's just so well crafted, well observed between two people who obviously care a lot about them. So, about and, and I'll say in here too, like I, I wasn't too thrilled about Bloodhaven at first because I'm like, it's hard enough to manage Gotham, uh -huh. but now you have, and in a way, it's a, it's a literal expansion mm -hmm. with Bloodhaven. So now Nightwing has his own city to look after. Mm -hmm. So it, it's also symbolic mm -hmm. of him breaking away for real from everything else titans batman everything else yeah but then you also have the birds of prey in there and i think this was a great thing now you have another city so it just establishes uh it, it gives you a, a inside scoop into the dc universe and how mm. it doesn't always have to be gotham or metropolis yeah there's actually a, a planet here full of heroes crime yeah and who's going to go tackle it and rise to the challenge? And here's the foundation if, for that. It fleshes out the East Coast, doesn't it, practically? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Excellent. One of my favorite books of all time. I've got to be honest. I've, picked it. I've got this book. I, I bought a Birds of Prey um, job lot pack mm -hmm. a few years back. And it was in there. And I was, like, so pleased. 
<coughs> I was like, yes, come on. There you go. One of the best books I've read. So there you go. Oh, nice. Yeah, my there. advice to the audience is um, if you see this at a convention, just do your Buy homework it. because the, the prices <laughs> have they're really all over the place. So you really want to be careful. Ask the vendor if you can actually look at the book. I I've think that's advice for everything. That, yeah, I mean, just ask them to take the book down from the racks. So you can look at it mm. because uh, I've seen some some of these are very, very overpriced. Mm. So I just cool. want to really be careful with that. Cool. It's uh, do you know what I found odd on. I think um, I found it odd on um, the Batman Adventures number twelve, which we haven't really looked at. We've, we've talked about the prices are the same UK and US. Normally, there's a huge disparity between the two. You know, so how would I find that interesting? Cool. There you go. It's funny we mentioned Nightwing because I'm sure in 1999, I'm sure there's going to be some Nightwing books down the line. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, sure that's going to be in there now. Excellent. Okay, so there you go. Three up, three down. You know, the old timers are doing it again as we normally do. Excellent. Um, we party like it's 1999, <laughs> man. Woohoo! Oh, <laughs> I don't even. I don't even want to think about how old I was in 1999. Ah, oh, damn me. Okay. Sounds um, like we need to talk to Kang or Immortus. Yeah, yeah, something <laughs> like that. Something like that. Uh, don't forget to check out the UCPM for all your favorite shows, which include The Professor. Uh, no Prize Podcast, all about the MCU, Disney Plus, and we talk some comics. Cool. Excellent. 13. And The Definitive Crusade. Definitely check that out for all the latest DC comic books, where we talk about characters like Nightwing and Oracle still. Yay. Yes, we do. And of course, don't forget outside the panels for all the gen on lots of up and coming Kickstarter and comic indie projects. What more could you want? All available on UCPN. Just check the links and go from there. Gentlemen, what a great start to the new year. Thank you so much for being part of it. Thank you, Johnny. Then I like favorite Nada. part of the week. Indeed. Excellent. I've been your host, Johnny Machine Hughes. And as always, adios. <laughs>